Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I want to welcome you to this historic Family Business Conference. This is the first time I've participated in such a global event. As a, a warning to begin with, I just want to say that I've had some challenges with the platform and we, I will do my best to make it all work for you and that trust that this will be a valuable learning experience. Each of us has a context. And my context is that I'm in a, a small mountain town about 200 miles west of Denver in the Rocky Mountains. And I would also say that uh, I'm also in this country called the United States of America, where we have uh, exceeded 42,000 uh, deaths from the uh, coronavirus. It's been very sobering, and I don't want to uh, be cavalier about that. I also want to say that I am deeply appreciative of the scores, thousands, tens of thousands of, of, of first line workers, people that are on the front dealing with this crisis. We will get through it, but it is definitely a difficult period for all of us in this world. Let me just say that uh, I started my business in 1968. And I didn't plan on becoming knowledgeable about family enterprise. But what happened is that my very first client was a family business. And I did what I knew to do, which was organizational and all of those sorts of things, structural. And I came away saying, I simply don't know what's going on when you have close relationships in families. And uh, none of my training really explained that. So I looked around in 1968 for some body of knowledge that would explain what I was finding, and it simply did not exist. So uh, I began looking for things that made sense. I talked to psychologists, psychiatrists, I talked to lawyers, accountants, and I came away with some kind of concept that I could begin to put it together in, in a uh, uh, coherent fashion. And what I would just say that what I learned early on is that you could craft an elegant business solution, but the keys to implementation were always locked up in the psychology of the family. So if you didn't pay attention to both the elegant business solution and the psychology of the family, you didn't implement. And if you didn't implement, why uh, you didn't get uh, hired again. So what I'm gonna do is tell you that I have focused on the psychological side of issues while I've also incorporated the business as well. So uh, in the last, um, I'm going to say more than 50 years, I have, I have really played an important role in shaping the uh, family business consulting field. And it's been very humbling that I've had a chance to do that. And what I would say is I simply uh, last year sat down and said, I think I can clarify how people think about family business. And so after years and years in this business, I've given a great deal of thought to how to think about family business. So if I had to say to you the purpose of my presentation, I want to influence how you think about family business. And to that end, I want to say that these four columns uh, hold up or are the foundation for looking at family enterprise. The first, of course, is alignment. And what is really important in terms of alignment is starting with getting a clear strategy. If you and your uh, cohorts in your family do not have a clear strategy, you will definitely be at odds with what you do. Now, I, I need to tell you that um, I have spent a great deal of time in the last uh, 30 plus years working in the space called values and values-based leadership. It wasn't called that when I started, but, uh, uh, and the language has changed. But what I learned very early on, uh, I'm speaking now in terms of the late 80s, is that there was a profile of families that stayed positively connected and in business. And that profile began with shared values. 
shared values about people, fundamental respect for people, shared values of uh, power and money. Uh, very important, that piece. That issue about shared power is really important in terms of across the generations, among the siblings, all of the possibilities that go with it. Then another quality about families that stayed positively connected in a business are they must be treated, have traditions, as well as an attitude of willing to learn and grow. Now traditions are the glue that hold a family together. The whole issue of gathering, and one of the problems that people are having today is that uh, with the, the coronavirus, people are not permitted to gather together for the funerals of their loved ones. And that's a huge violation of traditions for most families. And so that, that people are wrestling with that piece today. What I will also say is that over time, it's important to renew family traditions and introduce new ones. So in this whole process, learning and growing together and traditions, shared value, shared power, this is a way you stay vibrant. If you have all of these things and you continuously examine them in a learning process, you are likely to be well aligned. There's a parallel process that goes on and the, the issue is organizational harmony. You can have clear strategy in your business, but then you need to pay attention to how do you organize your business so there's harmony among the workers. What I will tell you is that it begins with how you treat your employees. And that means you have to treat them with fundamental respect. Then there's the issue of profitability. How much is enough? You know, one of the things we are debating today and perhaps worldwide is how much profit is just right and how much of that profitability should be shared with employees. A very ethical, very important matter, and it leads to the issue about having a business that is operated uh, from the point of ethical leadership. It's like the concept of being the best leader you can be, the best version of yourself that you can be, and totally ethical by showing up and doing the next right thing. I had the privilege of working with the Luck family, they are a very large, in fact, they're the largest uh, quarry in uh, North America. And I worked for a number of years with them and uh, there are some actual procedures to how we could build a mission statement, a vision statement, um, and a family, family mission statement. And uh, so if you would go to my website, and then you would scroll over to media and then down to videos and click on the videos. That will give you a choice of two columns of videos and the top one on the left is a video of Charlie Luck describing how uh, I worked with that family to establish the family mission statement. I think that would be an excellent thing, and Charlie is an extraordinary man. Let me also say that he gave me permission to speak about him a long time ago. Now I'd like to read to you an example of a family mission statement, and I would like to first of all describe how it was built. This mission statement began by family members writing down the words that they that related to in terms of their values. And they then proceeded to take those words and massage them into a statement. Now I'm going to read the highlighted words that they started with. Health, well-being, honest. We hold honesty and mutual respect as important. Loving yourself, love others, and living in harmony. Provide a safe, predictable place of employment. Compensate employees fairly. Independence, responsibility, accountability, appreciation, 
generous integrity, seeking fun and enjoying the fruits. Now, that, they had that whole mixed list, and they, they sat around and talked about it and said, how can we put that together in a contiguous statement that would represent who we are as a family? So I'm going to read it slowly. We are all committed to the health and well-being of our immediate family as well as our employees and their families. We are honest in all our dealings and hold honesty and mutual respect as the standard in all our relationships. We embrace, embrace the importance of loving yourself, loving others, and living in harmony uh, with one another, with our employees, our competitors, and all in our world. Let me just say parenthetically, it's time for us to look at one another as equals and that no one is, is above another person. Uh, we seek to provide a safe, predictable place of employment and are committed to compensate employees fairly. We honor independence as well as those who accept responsibility and accountability and express appreciation to those who lead and are generous with their time and resources. We honor the integrity and freedom of each family unit and encourage each of them to seek fun as they enjoy the fruits of our individual and collective efforts. That sounds to me like a family that I could greatly respect. Next is the issue of boundaries. As I said, uh, the technology here is a little primitive, but I'm working it off. Okay. Um, so the very first thing in boundaries is the importance of having well, clear and well-maintained boundaries. And now we're talking about family boundaries, ownership boundaries, and boundaries with the enterprise. People need to know where they stand and what are the prerogatives that go with that. And with that goes a structure, and it's a structure about clear defining of roles. I had a discussion this morning, actually with two brothers, uh, two separate discussions, and we are at the stage where a 55-year-old brother is ready to become the chairman of the board. It's a very substantial company. And uh, the uh, younger brother, younger by a few years, uh, is the uh, designated leader for the family office. And these two roles, if they are not well defined, they have the potential of being in conflict. So we are directly in the, in the throes of discussing what should be the responsibility and what is the accountability. The, the whole notion of you can't have responsibility without being held accountable. And so we're just designing a methodology for evaluating the performance of both the chairman of the board and the executive director of the family office. So that's a very living example of the need to, uh, to define those roles so that uh, those individuals are not being in conflict with one another. Then there's the issue of ownership. Uh, all of these require roles, owner, operator, prerogatives, employee responsibilities. These need to be defined inside your business. And if you are an owner, what does that mean? What does that mean you as an owner operator do that's different from being an owner? You could be a, a shareholder owner and not be an auto operator. And so if you are only owning shareholder shares, you don't walk into the office and uh, express your opinion about what you see in the front office or anything else. That discussion is for an owner's this, uh, group only. So the whole issue is that as owners and owner operators, you have different prerogatives, you have different things to do. And then of course, employees need to be uh, uh, very clear about their responsibilities and then they need to be held accountable. And lastly, we need rules for handling personnel matters. The, the, the things need to be kept private. 
they need to be handled in a professional manner. And uh, that goes with having a per uh, personnel function. This next slide is quite interesting to me. Um, and it's not fully loading. Uh, let's see what happened. Well, let me uh, describe, first of all, uh, where this comes from. This conceptual conceptualization, I'm going to try one thing and see what happens. OK, there, that's going to happen. Uh, the, uh, this, uh, this conceptualization is attributable, attributable to Josh Barron. And the graphic, and Josh Barron is in Boston. And Danny Cervantes, Danny is in Barcelona. And they're both colleagues of mine. And so by starting with the family room, we look at these, this blue uh, notion called the source of power. And the, the source of power in the family room is that everybody gets together and the things that we talk about are going to have an impact uh, on the legacy and the stewardship regarding the business. We don't talk about business details. We don't talk about who does what. We stay at the conceptual level and talk about the, the larger uh, concept of what the business might do over time and how it can impact uh, people locally and around the world. Next, we move to the owner's room. The only way you get into an owner's room is you have to own shares. Simple as that. So when you have shares, uh, you can be in that room. Then to be on the board room, uh, you, you have to be selected by the owners to be um, in, on the board and one person will vote. And then there's management. The financial performance of the company is in the hands of those people that are in the management room. And if you're not in the management room, you can ask questions. Questions are always permitted, but you don't participate in the decision making. Now, another way to slice this is to look in terms of the function of each of those rooms. So let's go back over it. I've said a few things already about it. But the function of the family room is building unity, developing talent, and, uh, and solving conflict. So this is about relationships and growth as a person and profession. So that happens in the family room. And notice that none of that uh, is uh, specific about the business itself. In the owner's room, uh, fixing strategic goals and choosing the board. You know, you have to decide as an owner what kind of a business you're going to be in, and you have to have some idea of uh, what kind of return you want on your investment. And then you need to choose a board of directors. And the board of directors would be people that have relevant relevant uh, backgrounds about the business. Notice it isn't just all the family gets together because that is not gonna be in your best interest when it comes to choosing the board. The board needs to reflect the kinds of talent that uh, is needed to operate the business and you need people that are relevant to that uh, talent to be able to evaluate them. So the board, is uh, monitoring performance and choosing a CEO or a general manager. So that's, again, at a conceptual level. Board members don't get tangled up in the minutia of the business. That's management's job. And so management comes in and they take care, they're responsible for the performance financially, and they are also uh, responsible for the operation. So notice how clear each of the boundaries are in these rooms. And if, if you have uh, a chance to print this out and present it at your next family meeting, a continuous discussion of these concepts will be very productive for your family business. The next pillar is about communication. And what I will just say is that uh, oftentimes communication is, is uh, dealt 
uh, uh, shorthand. And uh, what I can tell you is that communication, notice it needs to be clear and constructive. Now, that may sound a little strange for you, but uh, it's not necessarily warm and fuzzy. It's not necessarily uh, about a particular topic. The issue is when you communicate, you need to be clear and you need to be constructive. Now, I ask this question, why would you not be clear? And what ever reason would you want to have to not be constructive in a discussion about uh, communications about family business matters? I just don't understand that. So if you can simply describe uh, that these are your objectives, and um, when you then have a question, you can say to your brother, like my brother's Charlie, and I'd say, Charlie, it's not clear to me what you mean by that. That's perfectly good question. If it's not clear, say so. And then ask, how can we find a constructive solution? And so if a solution has been offered, you have a legitimate reason to say, would you rate that proposal constructive or not? And again, so the idea is it's really simple if you keep it simple, clear and constructive. Then there's the notion of effective resolution of relationship issues. One of the things that is very well outlined in my online course is the concept of restorative communication. This is a this cutting edge kind of material. And uh, quite frankly, currently it's being discussed throughout the United States about trauma, uh, respective uh, restorative communication. There's some special approaches when you have traumatic issues and you need to clarify the communication. Then there's another point of view that needs to be introduced inside your family enterprise, and that is plan for long-term success. Uh, so the idea is thinking into the future. This is a very important thing to have happen. And a lot of people are planning only for the short term and that, is, uh, that requires then a different kind of communication, a different kind of urgency, and uh, uh, it, it uh, does not encourage uh, that long-term view. Lastly, we have the, idea, the importance of a clear process for decision-making. When it talks to, this is an overlap between boundaries and communication. So we need the right kind of boundaries, who's involved, and we need a clear process for decision-making, such as we will present it, examine it, uh, consider the alternatives, and uh, look at the uh, criteria for decision-making. I'm a very big advocate about criteria-based decision-making. For instance, if we were able to go out to a restaurant tonight, we might say, well, uh, it must be within two miles, it must be able to seat uh, 12 people, and uh, they have to take us uh, for dinner at 6.30 p.m. So now you have three criteria, and you now go out and start looking at the restaurants that are in that geographic area. But the point is, the criteria make the decision, as opposed to whose idea it is. You know, like, I want to go to Italian. The point is that by having by using criteria-based decision-making, the criteria actually makes the decision for you, and it thus reduces the conflict around the ideas. So, uh, this is where the technology comes in. Okay. Um, so, uh, as we proceed further, we need to look at the whole issue of competency. What is competency? Number one, the capacity to deliver results. Each time, every time, you, can, you have the capacity to develop the outcomes and deliver 
that is competency. And what I say is that it's really important to be able to do that in your family business. Then there's the notion of continuity and stability. You may know exactly how to do it, but if you can't continuously deliver and have the stability of relationships, then that becomes a destructive or certainly an undermining force inside the business. Then there's the notion about sense of ownership and investment. Uh, it's very important for family members to learn what it means to be an owner in your family. It means that we show up, we look after people, we take care, take care of our employees, we honor them and respect them, we provide a very high quality product, and uh, we invest uh, and expect a reasonable return, which not a usurious uh, level of return. So the point is, is that it's important for a competent person to also have that sense of ownership, and ultimately they need to act like a, like a leader. Take responsibility and say, well, we will look into this. I feel responsible, and this is very important. Then there's a notion for competency of the grooming and planning for succession. Now, this leads to the next section, which I think is pretty interesting, and it's the whole issue of succession in the context of the four pillars. Um, notice that succession and context are paired together. Succession in the context. Think about your context in your business. What is, what is it? What is the ownership structure? How many family members hold shares? How many different families are involved? The whole pieces that go with it. And then the issue of how old are people? And is it, is it possible that we should begin planning for succession today? Now, I believe that succession planning starts a long time, and it means to start teaching lessons early. Now, I've arranged for you to have access to my last book titled The Little Red Book of Family Business. And you, I've arranged for you to have an electronic version. And so this is really powerful stuff. This is not a book with a lot of theory in the book. Notice the pages are bullet points because people don't want to read all the theory. They just want to know what works. And so that's what it is. So start teaching the lessons early. And one of the uh, lessons uh, is uh, fundamentally learning how to work and then learning to be competent in, in all things. That competent and stress that from an early age. And then motivation. Now, let me back, back up to this. And uh, at the very front of this book, the very first chapter says, Attitude. It says, one entrepreneur explained, my business is the most important business in the world. It keeps a roof over my head, feeds my family, educates my children, pays my country club dues, and makes my wife happy. I'm the luckiest man I know. Now, if you regularly come home from work and exclaim, wow, I had a great day today. Then go to discuss what you did and why it was so interesting, challenging and stimulating for you. Then everyone in your household will develop a positive attitude about what you do and where you do it. They might even want to help out. If, on the other hand, you regularly come home to grumble and complain about problems at work, family members might think you are a saint for going there but they won't see it as a place they want to work. Be aware that wherever you go, you are teaching attitude. Attitude is, is everything. If you have the wrong attitude, you're in trouble for, for all, the, all the wrong reasons. Now, when we look at these, these uh, four items, work, competence in all things, motivation, ownership, a uh, huge responsibility, all of those items are taught by example. I'm going to repeat that. All of those items are taught by example. 
So think about how you are teaching the lessons for your children. Now, this is right out of the Little Red Book. It's on page 19. And it says the fundamental task of parents is to raise responsible adults that have high self-esteem and can function independently in this world. Now think of that. Responsible adults, high self-esteem, function independently. What is the profile of the employee that you would like to engage for your business? You are looking for responsible adults that feel good about themselves, are happy, they can, they can roll with the punches, and they can function independently in this world. Now, that's what, if that's what you're looking in employees, that's what you need to start very early to train your children uh, to become. That's their profile. And of course, you begin by giving them an unconditional love. Next, all activities to re that relate to preparing children for what lies ahead can fit into uh, one of the three elements uh, above. So let's look at this. Teaching a child to work, to carry a job to completion and know that they have done the best they can do are among the most important lessons of life. Just think how great you felt when you took a job and you said, I did it and I did it really good, mom or dad. So the point is learning that very early is very important for the child. And it will uh, uh, reap the benefits as we go forward. So the ability to take a job and carry it through to successful completion brings satisfaction, enhances self-esteem, and builds a base for the next opportunity. So very early on, I'm asking you to establish competence as the norm. That starts very early. Do it right the first time, and it makes it uh, uh, a norm in the family. Talk about it. Talk how important it is to, to be really competent. And this is not about pleasing mom or dad. This is about the job and doing the job right and figure out a way to measure it and keep track of, of it and uh, insist on it. And we've gone, in, at least in North America, we've gone through a period where everybody turns out to be a winner. Well, I will tell you, I don't believe that. I think everyone has a chance to be a winner, but there are some kids that run faster than everybody else. They are the winners and the others are participants. So it's very important that we establish who wins and who doesn't, and you, do, you win by doing it right. Now, I've been look, uh, talking about uh, certain expectations and behavior, and uh, I want to say a few things about motivation. Now, uh, it happens that uh, Frederick Herzberg uh, did his research many years ago, but the people who have researched since then have found out the same thing, and the top thing that motivates people is recognition. It's kind of like we call them attaboys. You did a great job. That was wonderful. So by just that somebody saying that, the person feels good about it and kind of pumps them up a little bit. Then there's the opportunity to have input into the job. People don't like to be told what to do, how to do it, and all that goes with that. They like to be able to have some influence into the job that's to be done. And lastly, they want to do things that are intrinsically interesting. If it's not interesting, people don't want to do that. Now, there's a lot of psychology behind this. Uh, let me just stop a bit. I didn't mention that this is uh, my early book. It's called Family Business, Risky Business. And chapter three and four are important from the point of view of the psychology of family enterprise. I think you would find that very useful. Uh, again, so you can do that, get this on Amazon or directly from our office. Family business, risky business, how to make it work. Remember, this one is coming to you electronically, and I'll be very interested in your feedback about it. 
Okay, so now this is a little hard for you to see, so I'm going to go slowly through it. The two intersecting circles on the top, the left one is the ideal self-image. Each of us has an ideal image of who we are and what we want to be. The right-hand circle is the actual self-image. This would be the things we actually are. And so we look to have sufficient overlap between our ideal, which is the things we want, and the actual, which is what our parents, teachers, other people tell us. So a sufficient overlap between our actual experience so that we have a degree of comfort. We're going to be most comfortable when there's sufficient overlap between the two, the ideal and the actual. The fact of the matter is though, as you go through life, you experience a separation between the actual and the um, ideal. Something happens and it causes you to not think of yourself actually as the person you thought you were. So what happens is that that separation between the ideal and the actual produces discomfort, frustration, and anger. Those three things are in the category of psychic pain. And you notice that curving arrow goes down to aggression. The psychic pain produces aggression. The aggression can either be outwardly directed, so that's the active aggression, or it can be inwardly directed, which is passive aggression. Neither the active or passive aggression addresses the source of discomfort, which is the separation of the images. So what has to happen for a person who is psychologically healthy is they will go back to their ideal and say, you know, I can see where I screwed that up and I need to do better on that. So they're actually hanging on to their ideal self-image and they're suggesting that their actual behavior needs to change in order to get that back into overlap. Or it could be that you have this uh, self-image of being able to do something, but you always get uh, ranked low on the totem pole in terms of that particular activity. So what happens is your actual self-image is pretty unrealistic. So what you need to do is take a look at that and perhaps then change your ideal. So instead of being uh, at, the, at the top of the class, you say you want to do pass the, pass the course. So there's quite a difference between them. So the idea behind this is that if you have a family member who is less than competent, you're in trouble because you're setting yourself up in the following way. The ideal image of that family member is that they're competent, but if they're not competent, they're, you're, going, you're, you're going to have a separation of image. So what happens if you have a less than competent person, they won't get the attaboys. Let's see if we go back to that. They won't get the recognition. They won't be asked for their opinion and they won't be given interesting things to do. So the whole point of this is that what happens when you have a less than competent person is that you end up with a unhappy employee and in the case we're referring to, it ends up to be an, a family member. So not only do you have a problem with your business, but you've got a family member that's a problem. And so you've also got a job that's not getting done properly. So where did you make the mistake? The mistake is failing to raise the bar for entrance into the family business. If you go to my website, you can find a family business employment policy that has very stringent expectations for what people need to do in order to enter that business. You might not need a uh, family business policy that is as stringent, but you certainly ought to take a look at that so that you set the bar high enough so that you get competent people. Remember, the business is there for, uh, 
profits. The owners require profits. It's not there as a place to park family members who need a job. Needing a job is not a good criteria for entry into the family business. Lastly, I'm just gonna to touch on this point and uh, along about, well, that's interesting. Um, I'm missing a particular slide. And so let me just say that it only says transparency about money. People need to learn about money and how to manage their money very early on. And there's lots of information about what needs to happen. If you are interested in this notion of teaching children and young adults how to manage money, write directly to me and I will send you some links to that kind of information. So let me just close by saying that I feel very honored that I've had a chance to be part of this global conference. I really uh, prefer being in person because then I can look you in the eyes and see what, what you're thinking and how what I say responds to you. And that's a lot more fun for me. But in the meantime, I wanna also tell you that um, as part of this process, I decided to prepare an online course which is titled, uh, as indicated on the screen, Reimagining Relationships for Families and Business. I encourage you to visit the uh, referenced website and take a look at it, see if it's interesting to you. Then on my uh, website itself, uh, people have said my website is a treasure trove of uh, useful information. That's a wonderful compliment in my, my mind. And let me just say that Go on the website and wander around, see what you find. There's a lot, of, there's lots of very free documentation. There's uh, uh, columns. I wrote a column for the leading family business in Turkey, uh, the leading family business magazine in Turkey uh, for nearly five years. And most of those columns are posted. So the topics are all there waiting for you. And uh, we're always interested in feedback. In the meantime, I want to wish you well, be safe, stay healthy, and uh, show up and be the best version of yourself that you can be. Thank you so much.